Hi, I'm Mike Bird, and welcome to another episode of the Nazareth Tonight CR vodcast and podcast, uh, the program where we try to cover all things pertaining to the historical Jesus, the Christ of faith, and whatever there is in between. This week, I'm interviewing two very particular learned scholars, Dr. Jeremiah Coogan and Dr. Michael Koch, and we're looking at the concept of adoptionist Christology. And, and here's the funny thing. These two scholars, these two young guys, wrote articles on the same thing at the same time and appeared in the same journal. So if you check out the Scottish Journal of Theology, their 2023 volume, uh, Jeremiah and Michael at the same time wrote articles casting shade on the whole concept of adoptionism. And if you don't know, adoptionism is the view that Jesus is not the son. He merely becomes the son of God at some point and you know, baptism or, or resurrection. And they kind of explain how this really isn't the best category for explaining what's happening in these early texts. So um, I just think it's fascinating that these two guys were both working on the same topic at the same time with roughly the same angle. So if you want to know anything about early Christology, uh, particularly uh, why the concept of adoptionism doesn't really have great utility for explaining what's going on. You're going to enjoy this interview with Jeremiah and Michael. Uh, I'll be honest, the, the audio is not always great. I've tried to tweak it a bit, but I think it's, it's good enough to hear. So if you like early Christology, if you want to know more about uh, adoptionism and the like, check out this interview that follows. Well, here we are uh, discussing early Christology once again, and I'm joined by Dr. Jeremiah Coogan and by uh, Dr. Michael Koch, and we're discussing some particular things in Christology, particularly a category called adoptionism. Now, adoptionism can be defined a few different ways, but generally it's the idea that Jesus becomes the son. He becomes the son of God at some point, maybe at his baptism, his resurrection or some time like that. And many scholars have argued that the early Christology, the earliest recoverable Christology, is in fact adoptionist Christology. That's kind of like the, the first Christology, the first attempt to say who Jesus is was adoptionistic. This is often based on a reading of Romans 1, parts of Acts. And um, some scholars even find this uh, in the Ebionites, and they argue that that's the, the real the real earliest and first movement in Christology. And that's something you can find advocated by people as diverse as James Dunn, the Raymond Brown, and of course, Bart Ehrman as well. But some people are contesting that reading, that narration of the development and the origins of early Christology, including my fantastic, fabulous and learned guests I have here. So uh, Jeremiah, tell us, how did you get into this topic of Christology and adoptionism, because uh, you've, you've got an article you've uh, published on this. In fact, you've both published articles on the same topic in the same journal. I mean, like a, a year or two apart, basically. No, in the same issue, in the same oh, in issue, the same in issue. fact. In the same issue. Yeah, oh. we were really working on this right at the same time. Well, wow. talk about talk about brilliant minds think alike. Um, yeah, so on the very same issue, uh, it, it did seem a bit of an anti-adoptionist pile on. That's right, a bit of an anti-adoptionist pile on. So, uh, Jeremiah, why don't you tell us about how you came into this topic and what it is you're trying to say about early adoptionism? Right. Yeah. So I started thinking about the question of adoptionism during my PhD coursework. Um, and it then took quite a while for those thoughts to come into a published form. Um, so I've been working on this piece that came out in January for about six years. Uh, but what struck me in a seminar on theologies of resurrection was the vast range of ways that the metaphor of adoption, both as a Christological metaphor, but also talking about human resurrection um, in texts like Third Corinthians or in various um, parts of Irenaeus's corpus. Adoption was all getting sort of lumped together. And every time the language of sonship or filiation or adoption showed up, People said, aha, we have adoptionism. And the problem is that metaphors do more than one thing and can often be put to work differently by different people. And so I got quite interested in whether there was sort of a coherent adoptionist framework. And the more I looked into purported examples, 
the more I came to the conclusion that there are lots of adoption metaphors that do lots of things that aren't the same. And none of them, in fact, look like the thing we generally talk about when we're talking about adoptionism. And then some of the other examples of things that we call adoptionism don't have any adoption at all. And so it seems to be a category that's sort of been glommed together out of different pieces because we think it must be there, not because there are any good examples. And it's a category that just sort of goes searching for examples until it finds some that sort of fits. So that's the, that's the premise of the piece, that if we actually look closely at the examples of purported adoptionists from the second, third, even fourth centuries, we don't have adoptionists. We have people who are trying to think through who Jesus is, how Jesus relates to God, how Jesus relates to the Holy Spirit, how Jesus as a human might relate to a divine Christ. They're thinking through these questions and coming to very different answers. But we can't find any people who fit the criterion of what we normally call adoptionism. And so it then raises the question for me of why we're interested in finding adoptionists, why we're so keen on finding adoptionists when we don't seem to have any. Okay. I mean, can you think of a single text that you would say is the one that's been the most misrepresented? People say, this is obviously adoptionistic, but if you actually stick under a microscope, as we, as we would say in Australia, yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the Theodati, who are described in this maybe Hippolytan work called the Little Labyrinth, are generally the prime examples because they do think, or at least some subset of them think, that Jesus becomes divinized. And yet, there's no adoption narrated by anyone. But it feels like it has the low to high movement. Ordinary human Jesus becomes divine Jesus. Voila, we have adoptionism. If you, I think if you push harder on it, that actually falls apart a little bit because what it means for this Jesus to be divine or divinized is not quite as clear as our sort of low to high paradigm might imply. But at least here we have someone who is divinized, but no adoption, which is, I think, worth noting that no adoption gets narrated. That's the one I think people go for. I think, Mike, that's the one that you've sort of suggested is the best candidates yep. for adoptionism in your book on adoptionism and Christology. Yeah, I mean, your article required a little bit of a humble uh, climb. frozen, me. which doesn't bubble. Yeah, because yeah, I, I said, look, mate, look, the one group that might be adoptionistic are the, 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 the Theodosians or the Theodotoi. I said, look, that's maybe the one group that might be. But you're saying, look, even they are not really adoptionistic when it, when, it, when it comes down to it. So, you know, I should have been more skeptical even applying it to that group. Um, oh, well, thanks thanks for sharing, Jeremiah. Let's go to, yeah. uh, let's go to Michael. Uh, you've also got a, um, a uh, if you like, a, a bunny in this race to use a Canadian idiom. Um, so how did you get into the topic of uh, adoptionistic Christology? And I, th I think you're writing specifically with uh, on the topic of the of the Ebionites, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, I, I've been writing on the reception of the Gospels among various groups, such as like the Ebionites or Serifis. Um, and that's where some of my work has overlapped with Jeremiah's. And I discovered before he published his article, he gave the advanced preview. So I was grateful for that. Um, uh, and so uh, I think my approach in this article, I was looking at a text that's sometimes called the Gospel of the Ebionites and how it describes Jesus um, and asking, is the label adoptionism the best label we have? Um, so I, I guess to explain this, I, I teach a graduate seminar on Christology where I'd like to use your book, Mike, uh, Jesus Among the Gods. And... Um, you know, I like to emphasize there was a genuine diversity of ways of thinking about Jesus. Whether he was the prophet like Moses and the Davidic king or son of man or incarnate wisdom of word of God and so on and so forth. And so we need kind of categories to say, how do we compare these ideas that were um, like ideal types? So I give the example of like when you say docetism, how do you define that term? And I like defining as saying, that's to say Jesus only appeared to be human. Um, so other ways of thinking of Jesus shouldn't be classified as docetism. That should be used strictly for a certain way of thinking about Jesus. So the question is, is adoptionism a way of grouping certain texts or 
presentations of, the, of Jesus. So do they actually present Jesus as being adopted by God, or are there better categories that we could use for texts that do sometimes present Jesus as not being pre-existent or only being human and being exalted to the status of Messiah or divinized like the Theodosians? Um, is doctrinism the best category? Should we use something else? Yeah, so he is saying there's diversity in early Christianity and people are trying to create categories to explain that diversity, but adoptionism, as it's classically defined, isn't really a good fit for what some of these different groups are saying. And you're doing the case of the of the Ebionites and, and, and the gospel of the Ebionites. Yeah, no, that, I think that's a good summary. Um, so I get like the gospel of the Ebionites, uh, basically the text opens up with Jesus baptism. And it does look like Jesus becomes something new that he wasn't before in baptism, where the Spirit comes down into Jesus and it quotes the whole uh, text of Luke where it says, Today I have begotten you, um, and now he's the Son of God. And that's what lead, leads, a, um, leads John the Baptist to say, I'm not worthy to be baptized by you, and a light from heaven yeah. uh, de declares who he now is. So, um, so on a text like that, it's clear that Jesus is presented as just human who's taken on a new status. He's been anointed for the office of being the messianic son of God, but is he being adopted in that scene? Or, you know, I use this category of possessionist Christology where it's the coming of the spirit in him that anoints him for the office and enables him to do what he does. And um, that was one way of conceiving of Jesus' identity compared to other texts that may have argued he's pre-existent and incarnate as uh, from virgin birth or so on and so forth. Okay. Well, let, let me throw this back to Jeremiah. Um, I mean, based on the kind of one-two punch from yourself and Michael, do you think we're going to hopefully see a decline or maybe a little bit more caution in people using this sort of adoptionist label? Because a lot of people are trying to, you know, point with a broad brushstroke on a big canvas. They want to give very general... Do you have a lot of hope with that this sort of this idea of early adoptionism as the kind of ground zero for Christology is going to change, or are we are we kind of like throwing chaff into the wind that's blowing against us? I would like to see that change. And I think I think the biggest thing I'd like to see change is for us to just actually say what we mean. And so when my students say something is adoptionist, which they inherit from all sorts of text that they're reading, including things that I assign them. I assign them a good bit of Braden Brown, for example. Um, then I always want to ask, well, so when you say they're adoptionist, what do you mean? And where do you find that in the text? What are you actually talking about? And I'm not sure that, I mean, we, we, we're working in a very inertial field. I'm not sure that it's entirely possible to overcome this inertia because people will continue to discover texts, um, secondary sources that talk about adoptionism. But I think we can push people to actually say what they mean. And I think that that's the most important thing, actually, that we actually get clear on what we're talking about. Because one of the great values of adoptionism as a tool of argument is that you don't actually have to say what you're talking about. Um, it's a category that sort of serves as this giant umbrella to cover a whole bunch of different things. And then, as you said, it's a broad brush. And so then you don't actually have to have tricky conversations about confusing text. You just say, oh, here, we've got another adoptionist. Um, and I think really the most important thing is to push people to be very clear about what they're talking about. I'm less sanguine that people will actually stop talking about adoptionists, but I hope at least that they'll be very clear about what they mean when they talk about people they're calling adoptionists. Yeah. Uh, Michael, what's one thing you'd like to see change then about the study of early Christology? Um, as it's done. I mean, maybe we've reached this position because of a of simply recycling, you know, the same views over and again without critically looking at the at the, at the actual sources. Is there, is there is there one thing you'd particularly like to see changed? Um, yeah, I, I think I would echo Jeremiah's call for more nuance. So, for instance, I've looked at both the Ebionites and this person named Serifus, um, who are often identified as adoptionists. Um, and so if you look at Irenaeus, who's a late 2nd century bishop, who's one of the first to describe them, um, 
He talks about how the Ebionites deny that Jesus was born of a virgin, who we learn from later sources. There's debate about that. Um, but they argue he's just human um, who was observing the law and was identified as Messiah. And a, late, a later text says, by observing the law, he became a Christ. And that if you observe the law, you can become likewise. Um, and he's associated with a guy named Serenthus, who at one level seems to have a very different theology. So the Ebonites were these Jewish Christians, their name means poor ones, um, that Serenthus held this view that the high God was not the creator of the world. The world was created by an inferior uh, craftsman or power, um, and that the high spiritual God sent this Christ, who's this divine heir, to possess Jesus at the baptism. Um, and that's why Jesus could do all these miracles and reveal this knowledge about the high spiritual God beyond the creator of the world. So on the one hand, the Ebionites and the and, uh, Serenthus are different. But on the other hand, they both emphasize that Jesus was just this human being who something happened to him um, at the baptism. So are they, a lot of scholars group them both as adoptionists, but are, uh, I, I've argued that they both have a possessionist Christology but the, the difference is the Ebionites believe that the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus to be the Messiah of Israel, yeah. while Serenthus believed that Jesus was temporarily possessed by this divine being beyond the created world, um, who then left him before Jesus died because divine beings can't suffer and die. <laughs> so uh, I kind of like Bart Ehrman's category of saying it's a separationist Christology, yeah. where he's only temporarily inhabited by this divine being at the baptism, but who can't be crucified with him. Uh, that leads only the human Jesus to die and rise again. Um, so to differentiate the theologies of these figures and use more accurate categories. Yeah. I mean, in, if, if I remember correctly, in the case of Irenaeus's testimony about the Ebionites and Corinthus, there's actually a text textual variant about whether he says they're similar or dissimilar. Which kind of complicates the matter even more. So, did he say that the Ebionites are, you know, similar to Corinthus, or did he say they're not similar to Corinthus? So it's a little, a little negation. I think. Well, I think is it in the Latin? Is it in the Latin text? It's been a while since I've looked at this. So, I mean, and that complicates. You know, is he trying to juxtapose them or stick them all in the one category? And it's yeah, it, it's just layers of complexity. Uh, I guess we're faced with. We're trying to you know excavate some of these sources. Yeah, okay. I think the Latin text has that they are um, not similar, but there's a later Greek writer who wrote the book called the Refutation of All Heresies that yep. says they, he well, doesn't have the dots. <laughs> they are similar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, what I've argued is the original reading is they are similar because why is he bringing them up together? Yeah. But they're only similar because they argue that Jesus was just a human who wasn't born of a virgin. Uh, but otherwise, they had a very different view of how Jesus became Christ. Yeah, um, that makes yeah. Sense. I, I think I, I think the key point is that they're similar for Irenaeus's purposes, but that for the translator, probably in the fourth century, debates about the nature of the Holy Spirit make them very, very different. And so we have to keep in mind that translator's context because what we know about the latin translator of irenaeus from a number of different players we have extant greek texts is that every once in a while the latin translator decides to doctor things and clean them up and to make things latin speakers right by their yeah. standards in probably the fourth century yep exactly right um okay then well i mean can we say then um this particular for you jeremiah who was the first real bona fide adoptionist? Who's a guy where you say that dude right there, smoking gun in his hand, blood all over his shirt. He's the first adoptionist. I mean, you can define it how you like, but is there anyone like, you know, Paul of Samosata? I don't know. Some, isn't there like some Spanish Definitely not Paul. Of the medieval? So, so who's the first? Yeah, the first. And so, I think we're talking about Spanish adopt adoptionism, which of course John Cavadini has written a book about. So we're talking about the 700s, 800s in Spain. And that's also when we start, when anyone starts talking about adoptionism, it's both when we get our first examples of anything that looks like our modern categories. It's also when the category itself shows up. 
Um, and I, I think really we're talking about the end of late antiquity, the early medieval period in the Latin West, especially in Spain. Now, Spanish adoptionism doesn't always stay in Spain, but really we're talking about the end of late antiquity. Before that, we've still got lots of Christological diversity. I don't want to say that everybody thinks the same thing because we have, you know, enormous amounts of evidence to the contrary. But I just don't think adoptionism is really, as we think of the category, is really on the table for anyone. Okay, fair enough. And, uh, and uh, finally, I'll throw this over to you, uh, Michael. Um, if, if we're trolling through the source, did, I mean, is it just a, in early Christology in the second century in particular, is it just a cacophony of diverse voices or are there some, you know, particular, you know, nodes beginning to, to uh, crystallize as key centers? I mean, because you know, in my studies, I found probably the only thing that someone like Justin Martyr Marcion and Valentinus could agree on would be applying a angelic categories to Jesus. So, you know, angel Christology was probably the most ecumenical Christology there was, att attributing angelic types, analogies, you know, verses from the Hebrew Bible to Jesus, uh, maybe demiurgism that God creates stuff in and through Jesus. Do you see any sort of particular nodes or sort of, you know, meeting points uh, in second century Christology that, 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 that seemed to develop and, and, and develop some kind of, you know, quasi consensus. Yeah. I mean, I think there's overlaps, right? Like you could look at the Logos and John or the Justin Martyr and the later apologists. Um, but I guess I like to emphasize the categories I'm using, like possessionist Christology and separationist Christology or docetism. Those are not native categories, but they're, you know, a modern scholar's category to group texts that have kind of these overlapping traits. So it doesn't mean they're, the texts are all alike, but that there's a difference between texts where Jesus became something new and he was possessed by spirit and exalted by God versus the texts that say he was pre-existent in heaven and became incarnate as a human being or, or the docetic texts that say he never was human, he was only divine. So it's our ways of categorizing these things. Um, I do have a question for you both as well. Um, so I guess I was, we're saying that the category of doctrinism is not adequate because it kind of um, emphasizes the metaphor of Jesus getting adopted, like that. that's how he becomes son. Um, the question is, is that image used in the New Testament? So, like, you know, in Romans 1 and in the Synoptic Gospels, when the voice from heaven, you know, they have that allusion to Psalm 2, to the king of Israel, today you're my son, I begotten you, and I'll make the nations your inheritance. In Jewish theology, does the king get adopted by God, or is adoption not a native Jewish category? It's more a Greek and Roman you know, Michael Pepper studies adoption with Roman emperors. So, if that if Psalm two is an adoption, is that info, so? Is Jesus get adopted as king in the Gospels and in Romans one? And the other question is, how does that relate when Paul talks about the adoption of sons and daughters mm. uh, to the Spirit, right? In Romans eight and these other passages. Uh, so, I wonder what you both think about that. Well, Mark, you can probably guess what my view is. Um... Since it's documented, I you know whatever is happening in the baptismal story or in the you know, opening verses of Romans, um, I think it's a species of messianic Christology, uh, but I'm I don't think it's got the elements of adoptionism in terms of how adoptionism is classically understood. So I mean that's my two cents. I don't know what about you? What you about you, Jeremiah? No, I, I would agree with that. I, it doesn't have the contours of adoptionism as we define it. I think also it's important that we avoid setting up a contrast between sort of a Jewish Christology versus a Greco-Roman Christology. The New Testament texts are both Jewish and also thoroughly embedded in their broader world. And so I think sort of forcing a difference there actually does, doesn't do justice to Second Temple Judaism either, where Roman concepts of filiation and legal structures for sonship are already part of Jewish life in the first century. And that leads me parallel to Pepper, although probably with some different nuances, to want to argue that 
we need to pull apart the questions of declaration of sonship and ontology. The ways that using our assumptions about a category of adoptionism, we've wanted to see every declaration of paternity and affiliation as a moment of ontological transformation really just is a way of reading back the category of adoptionism we've already decided exists into New Testament texts. And I'm very happy to say that we have kinds of declaration of sonship Hmm. happening in the New Testament texts. But you then have to do a lot more work if you want to say that those are ontological transformations. And that's sort of what is required to make those adoptionist texts. At the same time, I also want to say that sometimes Mark, for example, is not interested in answering all of our questions in the ways that we might want to ask them. And so we have to let Mark be doing Mark's thing. And likewise with Paul or with Luke or with Matthew. So we also have to just sort of let the texts do what they're doing and not try to make them answer questions. They're not trying to answer in the ways we want to ask them. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. You're letting Mark be Mark, John be John, Paul be Paul, rather than imposing our own yeah. questions. Uh, it's probably the, the, the number one way to understand these texts on their own terms. So... Yeah. Okay. That's all. That's all. That's all good stuff. Well, as we finish, uh, can I get from you, good folks, um, one good book recommendation um, of of a book on Christology that you thought is really good, really interesting, challenging, made you think? Uh, do you have one particular book that you might think people might you know find find interesting or helpful? Um, Michael, have we, can we kick off with you? By the way, I'm, I'm not fishing for you to say my book. You know, this is this is not a kind of <laughs> obviously. Yes, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not fishing for compliments here. Um, my 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 vanity goes pretty far, but not that far. Uh, can you think of a, a really good book, either a beginner or an advanced one, that you think's a, a, a good read? You know, I did really like your book, Mike. But um, in terms of, I do think. Even though it's challenging, I think J.R. Daniel Turk's book on the human Christology and synoptics does, um, yeah, he has to think about the text in different ways. Like he he proposes this category of idealized human agents um, who they're not, so it might be a better term than adoptionism because it says that they're humans, they're not pre existent, but they're in charge to act on the God of Israel's behalf. Now, you could debate whether the synoptics fit under this category, but I think it fits the Ebionites, that Jesus is an idealized human agent, which differs from the followers of Theodotus, who he's divinized and made a divine being. So um, I think that book is helpful um, in thinking about our categories. And Jeremiah, yeah. for you? I would say, with, with the caveat I already have made about the distinction, the problematic distinction between sort of Roman and Jewish frameworks. Michael Peppard's book is a really good place to ask the questions we often ask in a different way. Um, I really like that book in terms of the conversations it brings out when I teach. I use that book when I teach. Um, and I think it forces you back to a range of sources that we don't always pull into the conversation in a really helpful way. So I'd say Michael Peppard's uh, 2011 book is really a good place to have conversation. I mean, that that is a good book. Mind you, I, I wrote my own book largely trying to um, refute, refute him. Uh, my, he's a charming guy. I must say, in, in guy, he's a char- He's a very charming guy. Very charming. Very tall, though. Very tall. Makes me makes me feel very like tall. a hobbit when I stand next to him. Um, but yeah, I like, Peppard's book I, I did think was good and interesting. And I, I think I reached a point of agreement with him. I said, look, you know, I fully admit that if someone's coming out of the Greco-Roman world, if they read Mark's gospel, could they think of some sort of like divine adoption or an, or an imperial adoption? Would that come to mind when they read Mark's gospel? I think I was willing to concede that, you know, like from a, a historical reader response thing, I could imagine someone reading Mark's gospel that way. I just wasn't convinced that's what Mark was really going for uh, when he wrote it. But I, I do agree. I, I did find um, Pepard, Michael Pepard's book incredibly stimulating and making me uh, think a, a lot of things and then other things were going on in scholarly ventures around. Uh, yeah, if I had to pick, uh, I, I, might be, I might be a bit um, selfish and I'll go for two books. Um, I obviously liked Larry Hurtado and there's a very good little book of his called Honoring the Sun. 
which is kind of a, a nice, neat summary of his lifetimes of work. So Hurtado's book, Honoring the Sun. But there's a book that's about to come out, and I reckon you guys you, you guys might like it. It's by a, uh, an up-and-coming young scholar called Jonathan Lukadu, and it's on the Christology of Ignatius of Antioch. And uh, that's coming out soon uh, in, in, in a series I edit. So keep, keep an eye out for that one. Um, I don't think it's got a precise title yet, apart from you know, the Christology of Ignatius of Antioch. But you know, I think Ignatius has got some very interesting stuff, and I think he's a, a really important um, link, or if you like, a, you know, a chain between sort of the uh, the first century and and the eventual proto-orthodox Christologies of the second and third century. And he's making a lot of interesting observations about Ignatius of Antioch. So, you know, from my end, they'd be the two the two books I'd be getting people to read on early Christology. Uh, but there we are. I, uh, I'll declare an end to the first uh, meeting of the um, anti-adoptionist uh, society. Uh, may people never speak of, may, may this dubious category be forever dismantled and may we never speak of it again. Um, but probably not going to happen. But anyway, thank you guys, uh, Dr. Jeremy Coogan and Michael Koch. Thanks for joining me to talk about adoptionism in early Christology. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed that uh, discussion, feel free to subscribe to the channel, like, share, leave a question. I'll do my best to answer. Uh, I also have my own hat in the ring on this topic. I wrote a book called Jesus, the Eternal Son, where I was kind of trying to, you know, engage people like Michael Papad and, and, and Bart Ehrman about early adoptionism. I'm pretty much on the same page as Jeremiah and Michael. So if you like this interview, you might also like that book I've done. Otherwise, I hope to see you around the channel.